I think the biggest key here is, is what we hear all of the time about investments is diversification, right? I don't want all my money inside of multifamily. I also don't want it all in self storage. I don't want it all in car washes. I want to have this nice diversification across the board. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Real Estate 101 podcast. As always, I am your host, Robert Leonard. And with me today, I welcome in Dan Hanford. Dan, welcome to the show. Glad to be here, Robert. Looking forward to sharing with your audience. The last time we chatted was on the We Study Billionaires podcast, and it was before your conference in Charlotte. Then we actually got to meet in person at the conference, but we really haven't chatted since then. I really enjoyed it, and I had a great time. I was curious, how is it from your perspective, your team's perspective? What do you have in the works for 2023? Yeah, so we had a, we had a great time at the, the first live in-person event uh, and located, we did it in Charlotte, North Carolina, not too far from our headquarters, which is located in Columbia, South Carolina. It's the, the, the closest big city, if you will, that is easy to kind of get in and out of. And so I had a great attendance, great, great time there. We had some really great celebrity speakers that were there as well. Got to rub shoulders with them and, and hear them speak. And next year, we're working on a, a few things as well. Actually, for the last two hours before this podcast interview, I've been strategizing in, in a meeting, specifically talking about MFI Con 2023. So we, we have already secured uh, um, Alex Rodriguez, A-Rod, to speak as our keynote, one of our keynote speakers uh, for the June 2023 MFI Con. And uh, we have a lot of other additional speakers. We'll probably have between about 50 to 60 speakers that'll be there speaking on mostly multifamily and apartment syndication. We're also going to have a separate track that's going to be on alternative asset classes like your, you know, your self storage, your mobile home parks, your, um, your express car washes, if you will, uh, hotels, medical office buildings, land entitlements, things like that. And that'll be a kind of its own separate, separate uh, track during the entire session that we're going, to, we're going to be adding on that we didn't have this year. And uh, will allow us to provide some additional content outside of just multifamily to kind of, there's a lot of people in multifamily that are, think they might be interested in one different alternative asset class or whatever. And this will give them the opportunity to be able to come to an event, network with some really good high level speakers and people and other uh, investors, and then be able to learn more and how to improve their game with multifamily and apartment syndication, and then be able to still learn about some of these other alternative asset classes. I can only imagine how good this next year's is going to be. This was your first time doing the in-person one and it was awesome. I had a great time. So I can only imagine how good it's going to be this time. Isn't it kind of crazy how I feel like it just ended and you guys are already starting to plan the next one. Well, I was talking to the team today and said, you know, we're already behind for next year, you know? Um, and so I, even though we feel like we're ahead of the game from where we were last year, because we made the decision kind of halfway throughout the year, actually beginning of this year in January of 2022 was when we decided to make the June one, a live event. And so we had like six months to put it all together. And so now of course we have longer than that, but uh, we definitely need to be putting some things into place to be able to make sure we have a good, great quality uh, event like we did last time because this is not one of those types of events where we're just trying to like sell in the back of the room some coaching program that's a high paid coaching program or anything like that you know we don't we don't sell anything from the stage except for the tickets to the next year's event right um and, that, and that's pretty much it so our, our we don't do coaching we don't do mentoring our goal is to really just provide a lot of education and awareness around multifamily investing for the active and the passive investor, which is which is one of the reasons why the tickets are a little more expensive than you might see in an event that's trying to sell you something in the back end. There's nothing wrong with that kind of a model, but that's not what our model is. We want to make sure we have a great quality event and we're only attracting the top quality people that want to be there and that are willing to you know pay that extra premium to be able to be, to be at an event like this. And that extra premium is not there just to, you know, make, make me a bunch of money in passiveinvesting.com. You know, our, our goal with it is just to really break even with the event. And this past event, this past year, we, we lost money at that event. And this one coming up next year, we're going to probably break even with that as well. And so it's not like we're trying to like, you know, pat our pockets or anything, but it's just a way to be able to offset some of the costs because it does cost a lot of money to put on a great quality event with some, and to make sure you have some great quality people from a speaker perspective, but also from an attendee perspective. What were some of your biggest takeaways from the conference? Was there anyone you met or any specific talk that you heard that really stood out to you? And what would you say to somebody who's listening to this, who has been told that they should start attending conferences, but they really, they just haven't done it yet. Why, why might somebody want to attend a conference? Yeah, I, I think the number one reason why you attend a conference like this 
is to be able to rub shoulders with other high level uh, investors, right? You can find those people as, as potential partners on future projects with you, but also be able to find other passive investors for your projects as well. And so being able to have that ability to be able to be in the room, because there's a lot of things we can do virtually, right? Actually, the MFIN event was done virtually for the first three years. And then we decided to go ahead and make it an in-person live event once a year. And the networking virtually is just not the same as being in person. Uh, be, if you know, there's a lot of people that I talk to that are looking for partners and to be able to kind of you know, partner with to be able to start their own apartment syndication business. And it's a little bit harder to have a deeper relationship with somebody if you never meet them in person. And so for me, even from when I look back before we even started and launched out the PassiveInvesting.com brand, I, 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 it was just me. Right. And then I found Brandon and then I also found Danny and we, we were able to form a partnership. But if I wasn't able to get out of my own comfort zone, go to different events, go to different, different, different venues and places to be able to network with other people, I wouldn't even know that I wouldn't even have found these partners. And not only that, most of the passive investors in the very beginning that we found were from those, those live in-person events, being able to be there and rubbing, rubbing shoulders with them and learning more about their needs and being able to really interact with them and then provide the opportunity for them to interact with me as well. And it allowed me to be able to raise more money that way from diff for different projects. But even from a passive investor's perspective, it allows you to be able to meet a bunch of different operators out there that are operating and you can learn a little bit more about the business. So you can feel more confident when you're placing capital into a project. For me, it was one of the coolest parts was that I got to meet so many people that were on the podcast. I've had a lot of the speakers that you had at the, at the conference on the show in the past, or even just attendees had been either guests in the past, fans of the show. So it was awesome to be able to meet those people in, in person as well. And so somebody who's never attended a conference, even, you know, you'll get all the benefits that you just mentioned, but you also get, there's probably a lot of people who listen to the show who have online, what I call online relationships, whether it's social media, Twitter, you know, whatever that looks like, that you can actually meet up in person and, and actually put a face to the name. Yep. I totally agree. Back when we chatted on the We Study Billionaires podcast, we tailored the conversation to a bit more sophisticated investor since that's the demographic for the listeners of that show. But this show here is a little bit more tailored towards newer listeners, newer investors. So I want to take a bit of time to go through some of the concepts of your business model, and then we'll get into the specifics of what you're working on. To start out, give us an overview of what a real estate syndication is and how and why listeners of the show might be able to participate in one. Sure. So a, uh, a real estate syndication is where you have multiple people that are coming together to form a partnership to be able to acquire a property. And there's normally going to be one main kind of promoter, if you will, who's actually promoting it. And that person would become the GP, the general partner, or the operator. They're all kind of synonymous words. Um, or sponsor. It can also be called a sponsor. And those people like us at PassiveInvesting.com will go out and we have a project and say, hey, investors, here's this project that we have together. We're trying to raise, you know, $10 million to try to acquire this $30 million or a $35 million property. And all those investors will invest. And the minimums are usually anywhere between about 50000 on the low end, upwards to 100000 as far as the minimum investment in each one of those projects. And so a lot of us don't have the ability to just swipe a check for 10 million. I'd probably say, you know, 99% of us probably don't, 99.9% .9 maybe, uh, to just swipe a check for 10 million to acquire our own property. So being able to still acquire that property, but on a small percentage basis and still be able to reap the benefits of it is really, really powerful. And it's what the institutional investors do all the time to be able to increase and juice their returns. So for us as, you know, kind of regular everyday investors, being able to go in and invest in a property and still get the nice returns that institutional investors are getting anywhere between 15%, maybe on the low end, upwards to 25, 30%. Um, is pretty powerful. And it's one of those things that has really picked up in the, over the last probably seven or eight years um, since some of the changes were made that allows this type of a, of a syndication to take place. And it has really transformed the real estate space in a lot of different areas. Obviously, we, with our group, we do a lot of uh, apartment complexes. A lot of, we, have, we usually acquire a kind of a B plus uh, or a class A apartment complex. We also do real estate syndications and self storage hotels and express car washes. And we also have a, a real estate debt fund 
uh, that is, that is, that is um, a part of our group as well. Uh, and since since 2018, we've acquired just over 1.2 billion in assets, and we're continually adding more assets to the portfolio every single month. And uh, and so uh, the, the kind of the the whole idea and premise is being able to pull the resources of multiple investors in one project to be able to take down a project that would be a little bit too large for you to take down on your own. I know you're not a tax professional, Dan. So anyone listening should talk with their tax advisor before taking any action, but. What are some of the tax benefits of investing in a real estate syndication and how does that or those tax benefits compare to investing in individual properties? Yeah. So the, uh, the, the actual, one of the biggest tax benefits of investing in real estate is depreciation, the depreciation benefit. So when we go into a buy an asset, let's say it's that same 30, $35 million asset, we get to do what's called a cost segregation study. And a cost segregation study it sounds like a fancy word, and it is, but it's really basically just saying that we are going to piecemeal that we're going to have an outside engineer firm come into the property, piecemeal it down to the uh, the sheetrock and the studs and the screws and the flooring and the countertops and the appliances, and we can have what's called instead of just straight line depreciation, we can have accelerated depreciation. So straight line depreciation for residential assets is 27 and a half years. For commercial, it's 39 years. And so because these multifamily assets are considered residential assets, they actually are done over a 27 and a half year lifespan for depreciation. Well, when you do the cost segregation study, you can accelerate some of that depreciation to the first five to 15 years and front load the majority of the depreciation those first few years that you own the asset. And then you also have what's called bonus depreciation. So there's three different levels of depreciation. You have your standard straight line depreciation. You have your accelerated depreciation. And then you have bonus depreciation on top of that, which right now the bonus depreciation is basically 100% of your CapEx spend in the first 12 months can be basically you know written off, right? 100%. So that gets added to that depreciation table. And so for, the, for those, that's one of the reasons why you see a lot of these assets will be over a five-year hold period because you're going to front load that depreciation schedule over those first five years. So you can cash flow off the investment and you get really great uh, paper losses on a schedule K-1 every year to offset the income that you made off that asset that year, but to also offset other passive income that you have that's even outside of your real estate portfolio that will allow you to have those benefits from a tax perspective. Now, when you take advantage of depreciation, you're doing what's called tax deferral. It's a tax deferral strategy. So you're not eliminating your taxes unless you do one thing. We'll talk about that in a moment. But you're essentially kicking the can down the road as far as you and as long as you can so that you can defer paying those capital gains. You can grow that nest egg over time. And the more you grow it, the more return you get. And so it's kind of a snowball effect over, over time. Now, the challenge with it is, is that over time, because you're using the depreciation, your basis in that property is going down so that when you sell, you have a higher tax burden because you're going to have depreciation recapture when you sell, but then you're going to also have this, this thing called capital gains. And so then they're taxed a little bit differently. But the nice thing about the depreciation is that as you're deferring it, if you can continue to defer those taxes and continue to 1031 exchange from one asset to the next as you continue to build it up, you can now, when you die, you can pass that property to your heirs and the basis in that property resets to the current value uh, at that time upon death. And now you've essentially eliminated that depreciation recapture on that property. Um, and even eliminated some of the capital gain on that property because it's being reset to the current value of the property at that time. And now wherever that basis is, if anything that grows above that is when you would pay that capital gain or if your heirs use some of the depreciation or whatever, when they did a different exchange, then it would, of course they would have the depreciation recapture, but all the former depreciation recapture that maybe brought your basis down to zero would pretty much be eliminated. And you'd have what is called that step up in basis. So you know, basically are eliminating that tax whenever you pass away. How does the 1031 exchange work for a passive investor? They're not controlling, somebody puts money into one of your deals, right? They're not controlling that deal. They're not controlling when that's sold or how they necessarily handle those funds when it's sold. So how do they manage a 1031 from their own side? Or is it done from the operator? 
Yeah, so it's mostly done from the operator's side of things. And it's one of the reasons why a lot of operators don't do it because it is more of a burden on the operator to do it. And it is a little bit more work and some paperwork and some, some a little bit of a headache and things like that to do it. But our goal at PassiveInvesting.com is to be able to help our investors continue to grow their nest egg. And if we can 1031 exchange and do that and help them out with it, because we're also helping ourselves out because each one of our partners, um, all three of us will put money into each one of the projects. And so we want to kick that can down the road as far as we can as well. And so we're obviously highly motivated to do that. And so when we go to sell an asset, we give the investors the option as to whether or not they want to 1031 exchange with us into the next asset. And we handle everything from them from that standpoint. Or if they say, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and cash out and pay my capital gains and, and move on, then they can certainly do that as well. So we give our investors the option to either stay in or cash out. And a lot of investors just like to cash out because maybe it's in an IRA, they don't really need the tax benefits or whatever. So they'll cash out and then they'll split that investment up with maybe two different more investments since we were able to grow that investment for them. Um, and so that's really the kind of the main reasons why you would want to be able to have that as a benefit. Is it difficult to do a 1031 exchange at the size and scale that you guys are doing it? And because I ask that because I hear of smaller investors doing it with a maybe 10, 15 unit apartment building or even maybe like a six, seven, eight unit and then, you know, 1031 in that. And I feel like, oh, that's not not too difficult, right? There's a lot of those types of properties that they could buy. If you're buying a 10 unit, it's pretty simple to buy a, a 20 or 25 unit to 1031 exchange. But you guys are buying hundreds and hundreds of units. And so with the tight timeline that there is with a 1031 exchange, I'm assuming it's probably can be difficult to identify a new asset and, and follow that timeline that's required. I would say that for most operators that don't, that don't have a, a kind of robust acquisitions team, I would say, yes, it is. It is a bit more challenging for them. And I won't say it's not challenging for us because it is challenging for us. But we have those systems in place that so far up to this point, we have been able to successfully 100% perform those, those 1031 exchanges. Now we always tell our investors that it is not a guarantee. So things could happen and we might not be able to effectuate and then you'd be forced to liquidate. You'd have to pay the depreciation recapture and the capital gains. But um, up to this point, because we can kind of control some of the timeline aspects of it before we actually close, we usually have one, we have always had one lined up so that it closes shortly thereafter. And most of the time it's it's within a matter of weeks because we can kind of t time it up with from an acquisitions and a dispositions perspective to be able to, uh, you know, close on a Monday and then hopefully the next Monday or the next week or a few days later, you're 1031 exchanging right into that next asset because you have to consider the cost of capital, um, uh, not only necessarily the cost of capital, but the lack of return during that time period where it's being held in limbo until you find the next asset. Some people wait up to six months because that's how long you can do is up to six months to be able to do a 1031 exchange. But our goal is to try to get that investment dollars, get those investment dollars working and moving and earning as fast as we can. So we've been able to successfully find a quality assets to be able to 1031 exchange those into, and it hasn't really made it been, a, been a big issue for us just yet. Since it requires a like kind exchange does it work if you guys are going from an apartment building to a self-storage deal or a car wash, or does it have to be apartment to apartment or self-storage to self-storage? So uh, actually years ago, many years ago, they used to do, it's called a like kind exchange because they used to be able to do 1031 exchanges for things more than just real estate. So you used to be able to do it for like, you know, I don't know, gold and silver and uh, cars and businesses. And you could do a lot of these types of exchanges, but now, Everything's been eliminated and it's only real estate. And you can actually 1031 from a single family residence into a multifamily from a single family residence into self storage or hotel or medical office building. As long as it's going from one real estate asset to another real estate asset, then you are fine. The only thing you can't do is, is like for the express car washes, when you acquire those, you're buying part of the real estate. And then you're buying the other part as the business. So you can't 1031 exchange into the business side of it. You would only be really 1031 exchanging into the real estate side of it. And that's where things get a little bit tricky and hairy. And so from the car wash perspective, we don't do any incoming 1031s into those assets right now. Um, that business plan for us for the express car washes is a little bit different than your typical business plan that we see inside of these other kind of asset classes like multifamily, self-storage, and hotels. Since an investor 
can only spread out their money and they can only have an individual dollar in invested in one thing at a time. Of course they can spread it out, but they can only put one dollar into one thing at a time. I think it's important to consider one's opportunity costs. Like you just said, you have the opportunity cost of, of money in between deals. How should an investor consider multiple investment opportunities for their portfolio when a syndicator such as yourself and passiveinvesting.com has multiple great investment opportunities? What should investors, specifically passive investors, look for beyond just the advertised potential return? Yeah. So there's a lot of uh, kind of nuances to these different types of investments. And, you know, I get, I get investors that'll call us up all the time and they'll say, Hey, you know, I see you have four different offerings available. I have a hundred thousand dollars. How should I split it up? Right. Um, or which one do you think is the best? And I think all of them are great or we wouldn't be putting them together. Right. I mean, so it's kind of hard for me to decide on one, but I think the biggest key here is, is what we hear all the time about investments is diversification right? I don't want all my money inside of multifamily. I also don't want it all in self-storage. I don't want it all in car washes or the debt fund or hotels or even other asset classes that I've invested in on my own personal portfolio. I want to have this nice diversification across the board so I can have this kind of blended approach, this blended return profile. And that way, if one asset class doesn't perform well one year, it's okay because I got these other asset classes that are performing well and it kind of lifts the portfolio up, if you will. So for me, I look at it from a diversification standpoint, but then there's also, I know we're going to maybe talk about this in a, in, a, in a few minutes here, but there's also some red flags that I look for that help us determine from my wife and I have just over 70 LP investments with about 18 different operators. And so with our own due diligence that we've had to perform on a lot of these different operators and being able to vet a lot of these different projects and, and deals is we've come up with this kind of red flags list of what to watch out for. Because I, I know it's challenging for, for new people as they're getting into the space to learn and know who to vet properly and to be able to kind of see exactly what are some of these kind of flags, if you will, to look for to go, okay, if this fl red flag is present, this is a dead deal. I'm going to close up my PDF and not, not re review it anymore, right? Uh, and that's kind of how my wife and I use that list is as a tool to say, okay, if, if any of these red flags are present, we're done. We're not, we're not going to look at that, that deal any further. And of course, uh, these are not yellow flags because yellow flags are more cautionary flags. These are truly red flags, which means stop don't go past go, don't do anything else, stop wasting your time and turn it off, right? And then and go to the next one. Um, and so having that kind of criteria in place is very, very important to be able to know kind of who you need to be going after. And some of these people, you just, you won't know until some of the answers to some of these questions about the red flags until you get on a phone call with them and start asking them or being able to uh, knowledgeably review their underwriting to determine if they're actually presenting things the way you want them to be presented. For everyone listening that wants to get the PDF or downloadable version of Dan's Red Flags, you can go to passiveinvesting.com slash red flags and you can download the PDF and, and all the info there. But Dan, for those listening today, break down some of those red flags for us, some of those most important ones and, and some of those ones that really uh, worry you. Yeah, so I would say that the one that concerns me the most um, is... We always talk about the operator is the key component, the keystone as to whether or not a deal goes is successful or not. And because that is a key component, one of the things that my wife and I always look for is we want to find an operator that has a successful background in business. And the key there is a successful background, right? Because we all know people who have run businesses before, but they end up running it into the ground, right? And we don't want somebody who's just going to you know, run the property into the ground. We want somebody that knows how to manage the property, they know how to put in systems and procedures and processes in place. They know how to manage people. They also know how to manage KPIs, these key performance indicators that allows us to determine whether or not the property is actually performing well or starting to underperform. And then being able to look at that information and that data and make some decisions and make some pivots if necessary to be able to change the, tra the trajectory of that, of that particular uh, business, if you will, or property to allow it to be successful as well. Because there's a lot of times you look at even during COVID that, you know, a lot of operators didn't really know how to operate, didn't really know how to handle things. And those that, that knew how to run a business 
and had that successful background in business knew how to make sure that they properly communicated with their investors about things that were happening, make sure that they were communicating properly with the residents that were on those properties and be able to perform those properties even better than they actually thought. So that would be one of the number one things. And it's actually, I wouldn't say it's, it's number one on the list because it is my number one, but I would say that is my number one uh, red flag is making sure that you invest with an operator that has some form of successful background in business. And it doesn't mean that they have to have owned the business, right? They could still be in some sort of managerial perspective, but they have to be in some sort of management or leadership position and and show that that successful track record in order to check that box for us. What are some of the other other red flags? Might not be number one, might be two, three, or even further down the list. Give us some of the other red flags that you look for. Yeah, so I'll give you another one that has to do with skin in the game. We talked about it earlier about how at PassiveInvesting.com, the three managing partners, we're always investing in every project. And we, we typically like to invest at least 10% or more. Uh, as a matter of fact, there was a deal we just recently closed. We were raising about 36, 37 million for that one. And the partners ended up putting about 5.2 million in that project alongside of our investors. And so there's certain projects like that, that you know we like to invest even more if we can. Some projects, depending on the available capital, sometimes we can't put the full amount in, but our goal is to try to be at that 10% mark because we feel like it gives a great alignment of interest for our investors. Plus, we have cash that we want to invest and be able to put in these projects. And this is our opportunity to be able to do that. And it also bodes well for the investors to see that, hey, these people also have skin in the game. And they're not just trying to put these projects together and make their acquisition fees or whatever it is, but we're going to actually put more money and real money into these projects to be able to uh, make sure our investors know that we're fully invested in 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 these projects. How do you set those amounts that you're going to invest in those deals? And are there times where you want to put more in than you can? It makes sense from a minimum perspective, right? You got to have a certain percentage in for a skin of the game. That's just the required amount. But what if you have a lot of investors interested in a deal, but you're also you and your management team are also really interested. You want to put a lot of your own money in the deal because it's, it's just a really good deal. How do you kind of balance that dynamic? Do you kind of put your, all of the amount that you want first and then just raise the rest? Or how do you, how do you balance that? Yeah, so we, we will usually allocate a certain amount on our side first so that we know we have a certain amount allocated. There's been some occasions where because of the demand, we've had to you know give up some of our portion. But for the most part, we allocate what we want up front and then we can raise the rest of it. And then the rest, the, investor, the rest of the investors can kind of fill it in. And then uh, we basically close it down once we're full. And so we don't, we don't bring anybody else in, but there has been an occasion where, you know, you, you close it down and an investor was upset because of timing issues. They didn't get in or they didn't get the email alert until the next day or whatever. And you got to bring them in for a different, for a little bit extra. And we have to give up some of ours. We don't like doing that, but you know, occasionally we do have to do that to make sure that we don't, you know, tick off any of our investors because, you know, we filled it up with our own money first, but they also know that we want to make sure we still have that, that, that same alignment of interest when it comes to our co-investment. I don't necessarily hear about this as much in the real estate world, but in the stock investing world, it's, I would say it's pretty common, not, not overly common, but it's, it is common from time to time for fund managers to return all outside capital because they've done so well with, you know, and they were invested in the fund and then they just keep their own internal or management teams money in, in the fund and they don't manage any outside money. Could you ever see yourself doing that with, with passiveinvesting.com? I mean, I can definitely see it happening in the future, but I don't, we don't have any plans for that right now. And where I have typically seen that is, is in these types of investments where you can do a refinance, basically are technically kicking out your investors and you're just maintaining the property for, you know, for however long you want to maintain it. Um, That's not our business plan. Our goal is to make sure we can maintain our investors. And because we know that if we can make sure that our investors are really, really happy, then we can also continue to grow together. Because our, our goal isn't just to do this for a year or two or you know just get to a, the billion mark and assets under management, which we're already there and, and then stop, right? Our goal is to continue to provide opportunities like this for our investors to be able to uh, you know grow our wealth and our investors' wealth at the same time. And so at this point, we have not uh, thought about doing anything like that or cons- we, we have considered it, 
But for us, we feel like it, it kind of creates a little bit of a misalignment with the investors to do something like that. Um, but I do know operators that do that. They'll put a syndication together and then they'll wait three to five years and then they'll basically refinance out their investors. Once their investors get a certain return amount, the investors are out and they keep that project. It's not a, not a bad thing. So don't tell me, I'm not trying to say it's a bad thing for the operators to do that. It's just a different thing. It's a different, different process, a different business plan. And, uh, and for us, you know, our, our goal is not just to, you know, uh, make ourselves, you know, uh, more money and grow our own wealth, but it's to make sure that, you know, the investors that got us to where we are today can continue to see those fruits of our labor uh, into perpetuity. What is your team's goal at PassiveInvesting.com for assets under management? I can only imagine a billion was probably one of the, the benchmarks or one of the, the stepping stones, I guess, for a goal is is 10 million next, then then 100 million or 50, or sorry, 10 billion, then uh, maybe 50 billion, 100 billion. Like what, what are you guys targeting? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I kind of look at it in a, in a little bit of a different, different light, you know, because, you know, a lot of times, you know, when we look at our goals, we, we, we you know, some, some groups will say, I want to have a certain number of units under management. And ours has never been about the number of units under management. You know, yes, we did have the goal of getting a billion in assets under management. And we reached that within three years, uh, which is, which, which, which was really cool to see. But at this point in time, it's not really our goal is to get to the 5 billion or the 10 billion mark. It's really the main goal is to continue to protect our investments and our protect our, our, the capital from our investors to have that preservation of capital and to provide uh, great risk adjusted returns for our investors. And the primary goal is to grow our wealth and our investors wealth for many, many years. And if that means we're getting to 5 billion or 10 billion or who knows, 100 billion over the next several years, then so be it. Right. Um, but if we end up only getting to three billion, but we're still accomplishing that goal, that's really what we're looking for is, is to make sure that we can uh, protect our own capital and our investors capital and also make a nice return on it as well. I think you guys show that kind of approach in your conservative underwriting. You stress test your properties at a 60 percent or less occupancy. You use pretty conservative rental rates and occupancy rates, and then you build into your business plan at least eight months of reserves. So I'd say that that's pretty in line with with everything you just said, but how do you use those underwriting criteria to compete in markets that are highly competitive and full of capital? Yeah, it's it's very challenging, and I'll say this this year has been more challenging because of the debt market being all over the place. But yeah, I'll say it's always been challenging, right? Because you know one of the things that we always do is we always have that that, that cushion in there of operating reserves, so that you know, we don't have to worry ourselves or our investors don't have to worry about, you know, future capital calls and things like that, that can impact the property and affect the returns quite a bit. And so for us, we'd rather raise that extra money and provide that kind of extra level of, of comfort and cushion for our investors to realize that we have ample operating reserves on our properties. And we've actually been doing that ever since our first acquisitions, because on our very first acquisition, we made the mistake of not raising enough money for that project to be able to complete the renovations. And so the partners had to come out of pocket and put up our own money to be able to front some of the, the renovations so that we could continue to perform on that business plan. And we did, we ended up outperforming on that property when we sold it, but we were able to, we were able to, yes, but uh, we had to as partners put money up because of our lack of, of having enough reserves in there from a CapEx perspective, but also from an operating perspective. And we didn't charge the, the property for that, for that money as a loan. Uh, as a matter of fact, the operating agreement says that we can charge up to like, I don't know, probably 10, 15% to be able to loan the property money. But as partners, as, as the general partners, we didn't feel like it was right for us to be, you know, charging the property money when it really was our fault from the underwriting perspective that we didn't plan for enough capital from the very beginning. And uh, at the same time, I never want investors to think that we're just loaning money to a property just to make that money, right? And so up to this point, we, whenever we've had to do that, we've loaned the property the money at 0% and that's it, right? Just so we can make sure we can maintain that business plan. That very first asset was the one that gave us the most challenging, that had the most challenging um, a time afterwards from a capital perspective. But ever since then, we always made sure we had ample operating reserves. So we never got into that position where we actually had to put up money for a property, which is, uh, it's good to have a, of an operator that has the pot, the deep pockets enough to be able to put money up like that when it's net, when it's needed and necessary. And I would say that we would do it again, right? If we had to do that again, before we even did a considered a capital call, we would be able to put some of our own money in there first and put it at 0% until we had to sell the property or, or had enough cash spinning off of it to be able to pay us back. 
Um, but that's, that's kind of one of the other red flags is not investing with a group if uh, they're not financially stable. And you can tell whether or not they're financially stable or not based on their underwriting. You know, if they're, if they're taking their underwriting and they're giving themselves really high fees in the beginning and uh, they're giving themselves uh, big splits in the beginning as well, but they're also not doing a preferred return, it usually means you're dealing with an undercapitalized group that needs that cash to put food on their table. Um, otherwise, they won't be able to quit their corporate job or they won't be able to uh, put food on their table for their family because they don't have enough money. And so there's somebody like that I do not want to invest in because if the property does start to go south, I want somebody that can be able to go into that property and help it keep it afloat. And that's also why the, lend the lenders require us to have these loan guarantees as well, because they want to make sure, even though they're non-recourse loans, they want to make sure that they actually have the ability to be able to put those uh, that put that cash up if the property is starting to underperform. Let's talk a bit about your debt financing. Smaller individual real estate investors are typically pretty limited with their financing options that they have available to them, but large funds such as yourself, we're acquiring multi hundred unit properties. You have access to a lot more financing options such as family offices, hedge funds, and sometimes even insurance companies. Who does passiveinvesting.com typically obtain its debt financing from and how do you commonly structure it? Yeah. So it's from, from a debt perspective, it really just depends on who has given us the best rates. Um, and do we have a really, have we had a relationship with them in the past? So there's been, there's been some years where it's been all bridge financing and no agency debt. And then there's a time where it switches where agency financing is better than from a terms perspective than bridge financing. Right. And it kind of, it's kind of weird how it kind of flops back and forth. Um, but you really have to have a, we have a, our director of capital markets and that's his goal and his, his job is to go out there and find the proper debt for the property that we're acquiring. And so it, it, depending on the asset, it might be a local regional bank. It could be a, a larger institutional fund, like a, a life insurance company or a family office or, or hedge fund or whatever it might be. And then uh, it could just be the agency debt, right? Where you just are having a, a kind of lower levered, lower interest rate, uh, a debt when it comes to the acquisitions on one of these properties. So it really just depends. So it's, there's never been a, this is the thing that, that passiveinvesting.com goes after. Passiveinvesting.com goes after all debt to determine what's the best option for that particular property. What are you guys seeing change in the debt markets with the current market conditions that we're experiencing right now? Well, uh, interest rates are obviously rising and on the rise, and I think they're going to probably continue to rise in the short term. And I think probably it's going to stay like this for the next probably 12 to 18 months or so, and then you'll start to see it uh, ticking back down to kind of stabilize things after they try to try to uh, you know, flatten out the, the inflation curve, if you will. But uh, the terms have definitely changed as well. So when you're doing bridge loans, it's usually going to be a, a floating rate, and so the, the, the spreads are increasing. And we're also seeing uh, agency financing. Uh, the interest rates, are, interest rates are going up, but they're still lower than bridge financing, but they're also lowering their LTV as well. And that's mostly because valuations have been so high and now that debt service cost is going high, it's causing that loan to value to go down to be able to maintain that. Usually it's a 1.25 DSCR, the debt service coverage ratio on the, on the different loans that we're getting for these assets. So a lot of those different types of dynamics is what are, the, are some of the things that can affect the price that we're able to pay for a property, but also uh, the different types of rates or terms that we're getting from these different lenders. How about on the equity side? Is the current environment impacting how you and your team are able to raise capital for your deals? Is it making it more difficult? And are you finding that investors are looking for or requiring different things than they had been in the last 6, 12, to 24 months? Um, I wouldn't say they're ever really requiring anything different. I think they're still staying as the fundamentals of, an, of kind of real, an, real estate syndication and investing passively. Um, I will say that, that the sentiment, I think over the last really kind of two to three months has really started to shift towards a more conservative, uh, you know, holding on to their capital a little, a little bit more. And the reason why I say that is, is that, you know, we, we're still, this year we've raised more money than we have last year. And so we're, we're on track to, to outperform what we did last year. And last year we raised 196 million in capital from our private retail investors. And we're already past that already this year. But 
Uh, I do think that the sentiment has changed a bit and we're, we, 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 in some of our projects, it's been a little bit slower to raise the capital. We had to put a little bit more effort into raising the capital over these last several months. I think a lot of it just has to do with the uncertainty of the market, uh, which is also why we've seen an increase in our debt fund. So our debt fund is a more, it's a liquid investment where, or a semi-liquid investment, you would say, where they, investors can put their capital into that particular fund, the debt fund, instead of earning, you know, one or 2% in the money market right now, they can earn 6% and they can, that can also be compounded, but then they can call their capital back out of the debt fund at any point in time in the future. And we have up to 90 days to, re to remove that capital for investors. And we started that in June of 2020 uh, with our own capital, put in seven figures of our own money to start that company debt fund and put the borrower facing front together of that called Rehab Wallet. And uh, since then, we've now placed over $130 million in loans with that fund. And we actually ended up launching it in October of 2020 after we've kind of put all the different pieces of the puzzle together, if you will, on the team to support it. And then uh, since then, you know, we have right now around 52, 53 million in that fund. And we rotate that capital about 2.3 times a year. And we're able to lend that out on with, with short term six month loans to be able to provide that opportunity for investors to have the liquidity option to be able to call their capital back within that short period of time. And so we are seeing an, an increase in investments in that um, because of the flexibility of having the liquidity to it. And it's not being you know tied up into an asset uh, like you would if you put it inside of a multifamily self storage or a hotel asset. Is that money typically lent as if you guys are like a hard money lender? Correct. Yes. So these are basically being lent out to local fix and flippers and rehabbers. They're going to be buying a home, putting up some money for rehab, and then turn around and selling it. And so all of these loans that we're giving on these are always first position liens. We're only giving it to an experienced borrower. So it can't be a newbie that just learned it from a, a weekend, you know, real estate seminar or something like that. They have to have experience doing this and show that as a, on their track record. And then uh, we we can you know provide that loan to them to be able to do it. And we loan it out at twelve percent plus two points, and like I say, we roll that two to two point three times a year, and uh, and that allows us to be able to continue to uh, provide the compounded returns to the investors, but also to be able to continue to for those that want the payout, they can have it as well. But for those of people who are you know want to put their money in for six months, nine months, they can and they can call that capital back at any point in time in the future. With everything that's going on in the market right now, a lot of investors are finding themselves wondering if they should sell some of their properties or maybe they should hold on to them. How does PassiveInvesting.com determine when the right time is to dispose of an asset? What if an asset's still performing well, but the predetermined hold period has been reached? Yeah. So uh, typically what we're doing every year on our assets, and it's usually multiple times a year, like two or three times a year, we have our brokers that we bought the properties from that will be given the opportunity to give us a BOV, a broker's opinion of value. And we not only go to that one broker, we actually shop to about four or five different brokers that are in that particular space and have them give us a, a value, an opinion as to what we could sell that property for at this current time. And so if for some reason we can sell that property now and we've already outperformed those projections, then we can hold on to that property. I mean, we, can, we can sell that property instead of holding on to it. Now, a property that comes to the five-year mark that is still not hitting those returns, it's a matter of looking at the overall metrics to see, could we hold on to it for another one to two years and outperform that property? Or do we feel like we've maxed the benefit of that property? Um, up to this point, we've never had to hold a property long enough to get to that point where we're like, we've held it for the long, for the, for the full five years that we said we were going to hold a property. Um, usually we're selling them around that kind of two and a half to three and a half year mark right now because of how the market has been lately. Um, but there's a lot of different options that we have from a, from a debt perspective, from a refinancing perspective, and from a, an ability to be able to go ahead and sell in 1031 exchange and snowball that return effect for the investors. Myself and a lot of our listeners struggle with focus, especially within real estate and entrepreneurial ventures in general. I think a lot of times people hear about the next best real estate investing strategy or the next shiny object. And so they bounce around a bit without really sticking to one strategy. Your team at PassiveInvesting.com is working successfully with multiple asset classes and strategies. Like we've talked about multifamily, self-storage, a debt fund, and even car washes. How do you balance diversification with multiple asset classes versus doubling down and really focusing on what you guys are really good at? 
Yeah. So I will say that, you know, one of the things that we were really good at is putting our, our, the systems and procedures and processes in place as we add additional asset classes to our portfolio. So when we first got started, even even today, the majority of our holdings is in multifamily. So I'd probably say, you know, of our, you know, $1.2 billion in acquisitions, about probably 950 million of that is uh, multifamily, right? And really probably even closer to a billion is, is, is in multifamily. And then once we had that perfected, we decided let's go ahead and add on self-storage because we had a lot of investors asking us about it. Are we going to be doing something like this? And one of the reasons why we called the company PassiveInvesting.com and not you know MultifamilyInvesting.com is that we wanted to have some alternative asset classes that we could add to the mix of multifamily as we continued to grow. And so one of the mistakes that I made in the very beginning in business is I actually, my wife and I also own a group of non-surgical orthopedic medical clinics here in South Carolina. We have four locations. And when we opened it from one location to the second location, we made a big mistake. And it was, we actually took our eyes off of the main location, took our entire core team and transplanted them into the new location. And guess what? The new location did phenomenal. We were we were cash flow positive in the first two months and it was profitably like, like you wouldn't believe. The problem is we took our eye off the main location, the first location, and it started to go down and suffer. And so one of the things I learned from that is that when you want to grow from one location to the next or from one business unit like multifamily, you want to add on something like self-storage, is you got to have a completely separate team that you bring on, right? And so we actually don't take our multifamily team and go, okay, now guys, we want you to start buying and looking at self-storage and, oh, we want you to start buying hotels. We don't do that. We go, okay, multifamily team, you're doing a great job. Pat on the back. All right, now let's go find another team to do self-storage. Let's go find another team to be able to, to, be able to you know, head up the, the hotel and the express car washes and the debt fund. That way they're not being spread out too thin. And we make sure we have our investors understand that we have attention on each one of these different business units as we continue to add it on. It's one of the reasons why we haven't gone after all of them from the very beginning, right? So in the very beginning, it was multifamily. Let me add it on self-storage. Let me add it on express car washes and then also the hotels. Is it harder to find the people or the assets to buy? I don't know. I would probably say it's about equal. Um, assets are definitely hard to come by. And, and I would say from a, from a people perspective, I don't want to say we've been really lucky, probably more blessed than anything that we have a really good solid team, right? Our, our team is very great. Uh, they, they all work really well. Our entire team is remote. So we don't have a, you know, high rise, you know, 13th floor or 20th floor or whatever in a high rise building. We feel like we, uh, we work better and we can acquire and, and, and attract a great quality talent and talent pool by not making them move to where we are, right? They can stay wherever they are. We can stay remote. And, I, and I'll, I'll tell you that if it weren't for COVID, I probably wouldn't have been doing it like this because I was a big believer in the in-person. You got to be here. I want to have meetings and, you know, have that face to face and, you know, we've been able to incorporate some of those face-to-face -face things throughout the year as we're going throughout the year and as we're doing some trainings and things like that. But for the most part, we don't see each other during the regular days, uh, during the regular business days or whatever. It's all remote. We, we're all connected via Teams and we have the ability to have that communication back and forth with each other very, very seamlessly. But uh, for us, we're all remote. And I think that's one of the things that has allowed us to make it a little bit easier for us to attract uh, a, a good talent pool from across, across the country. Cause we have people from all the way to California, to Chicago, to New York, all over the country that are, that are working for us. And we have around like right around 40, 45 people that are now working full-time for us, uh, for passiveinvesting.com. Dan, for anybody that's listening, as we wrap up the show, I want to give you a chance to tell everybody listening where they can go to find you. Where's the best place to go? Passiveinvesting.com. Where, where else should people find you? Sure. Yeah. No, obviously you can go to passiveinvesting.com. Um, if you're interested to find out more information about us, uh, the red flags articles on there as well. You can also go there. And if you're interested in kind of passively investing with us or at least reaching out to us and asking some questions to us, our investor relations team is there that can schedule a phone call with you, discuss your investment goals and see if our group is the right fit for you. And uh, you can do that on the website, passiveinvesting.com. The right top right-hand corner of the page is a big blue button that says, join the Passive Investor Club. You can click on that button, fill out the form, and then schedule a phone call with one of our team members to be able to discuss that 
to discuss your investment goals with them. And then the last place you can do it is if you want to just connect with me and then you know, find some of the more of the content that I put together on a regular basis, you can go to my LinkedIn profile and you can just go to linkwithdan.com, linkwithdan.com. That'll just take you straight over to my LinkedIn profile and you can connect with me there and we can kind of have that further conversation from there. I'll put a link to all the resources Dan just mentioned in the show notes below. I'll also put our other conversation that we had on the We City Billionaires podcast as well in the show notes for anybody that's interested in checking that out too. Dan, thanks again for taking valuable time out of your day and joining me. I really appreciate it. Awesome. You too. Thank you. I know we're talking about real estate, but that also works into other uh, aspects of life is you overlook all the red flags in order to make that work. So it's the same thing in this case. 